uh, let me introduce our next speaker, which is none other than my dear friend, Scott Nelson, which I think most of you know. Uh, Scott is, uh, is really someone special because he's right now in Haiti and he was in Haiti right at the time of earthquake as well. Um, I think he, he was actually in the neighboring country and then moved over to Haiti during crisis. Uh, he's currently the medical director and chief of surgery at the Haiti Adventist Hospital. He's won numerous awards, including the Humanitarian Award with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon, and also serves as an associate professor of orthopedics, <clears throat> orthopedics at Loma Linda in California. So welcome, St uh, Scott. And Scott's going to talk about decision-making in austere environments. Okay, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Is everybody able to see this and hear this? It says I can't start yeah. my video, but maybe seeing me may not be as important. I think you can We're, you can you can uh, switch your video on. If not, I can. Help. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, it's okay. Uh, you can see the pictures at least. And uh, thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you, and especially a big thanks to Sanjeev for bringing us all together. Maybe I can uh, catch up a little bit on our time here, but it's a privilege to participate. I actually happen to be in California right now. I, the situation in Haiti has spiraled uh, to new depths recently, and I didn't actually make a decision to leave, and I'm planning to go back there as soon as the situation permits. But I came to California for a short trip in March, and the airport's been closed until last week, and now we're working on ways to get back there. And I've been doing a little bit of work on academic projects and at Loma Linda in the meantime, and still staying in close contact with our hospital there, which is fully functioning in spite of all of the challenges. And uh, let's see if we, uh, okay. Um, the topic this morning is how to make limb salvage decisions in austere environments. And I just wanted to demonstrate a few cases, how we go about those decisions, and hopefully put a little bit of object objectivity to it. Uh, this little girl came to our hospital last year after being hit by a car and uh, had these fractures and uh, most significantly was this soft tissue injury. And when we look at a case like this and try to apply the mangled extremity severity score, uh, it's still a difficult decision. And uh, this, some of these studies can help us somewhat uh, make these decisions. It's a little bit different in kids than adults. And this particular study was uh, from the Hospital of Sick Kids regarding 36 children, 28 in the limb salvage group and eight in the amputation group. And it showed that the, the MESS score is sensitive, uh, but uh, it's especially even more specific. Um, the MESS agreed with the surgeon decision for amputation in only 63% of cases. So there was eight cases that were amputated in this uh, series, or eight, eight cases that were predicted um, for amputation, and uh, Five of the five five of the eight cases that were amputated were predicted for amputation. It's difficult in these types of studies to make a lot of sense of this because the cases that were amputated never we we actually don't know if they could have potentially been salvaged. And uh, when we look at some of these criteria and applied it to this patient, we still had a difficult decision. This patient was debrided three times. The situation was deteriorating, the bone was desiccated, the fracture was exposed, and we consented her parents for amputation. And when I took her back for the amputation, I decided to clean it up a little bit more. And the ultimate outcome is this. And my colleague at the hospital in Haiti did some gastrocnemius and soleus flaps. We were able to skin graft her. Her hemoglobin dropped down to 3.6 after surgery and she was desaturating. I had to give her a unit of my own blood because blood bank is extremely limited in Haiti. Uh, that actually clotted off and didn't work, but we had to find some other blood and uh, not only save her life, but also her limb. Um, the, another study that evaluated the MS uh, showed <clears throat> that uh, 
the MEF score may vary a little bit in pediatrics. The typical MEF score involves four different uh, domains, the skeletal soft tissue injury, uh, limb ischemia, the overall condition of the patient or shock, and it also takes into consideration age. So the MEF really shouldn't vary um, based on, uh, it shouldn't be a different score for kids than for adults because it's already taken that into consideration. And this study actually showed that the MES of 6.5 may be more appropriate for kids saying that, uh, which is interesting, it's almost paradoxical, saying that it, kids might even need to have a slightly lower MES score than what's typically accepted for adults. But overall, this MES score um, will oftentimes not tell you which limbs you can salvage, but if it is over 6.5 or 7, then it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to salvage something that's going to be beneficial for the patient. Nonetheless, in the in domain that we, in the environment that we operate, we do everything possible we can to salvage these limbs, knowing that there's not going to be resources available oftentimes for providing a lifetime of prostheses. Um, we use some of the techniques that are outlined in this article at TSRH with acute shortening, use of external fixators, and by necessity, we don't do free flaps because we don't have that available, but we have learned a number of rotational flaps and local soft tissue flaps. This 16-year-old girl came to us after the Haiti earthquake that happened in 2021. She'd been treated somewhere else with some primitive treatment that was less than adequate. The wound was already severely infected. And after doing several debridements, we just were not able to clear this infection. And uh, she ended up with an amputation. And hopefully, that's the best choice for her in the long term. At our center, we're able to provide prostheses, at least until the most recent downward spiral of events in Haiti. Our program's on temporary hold, but um, it uh, still is a, a way that we're able to help our patients. We have a number of patients that come to us with severe congenital deficiencies as well, that these decisions can be difficult. This girl had a projected limb length discrepancy of over 30 centimeters and I did a brown rotation plasty for uh, her. Uh, by normal measures, it actually turned out pretty well. We were able to get her a nice prosthesis. I showed her a picture in last year's presentation at this symposium. And uh, we have an update of her follow-up just last week from somebody that visited her on the uh, outlying island where she lives. And this is Junie today. And uh, this is a real disappointment for me to see her. Apparently it's easier. She finds it easier to walk with crutches than to use her prosthesis. And we'd like to bring her back to work with our rehab team for a couple months. And I think we could maybe encourage her enough to take, have a benefit from that operation, but given our security situation, it's just not possible at the moment. This is a two-year-old that came to us with type four uh, tibial hemimelia, which is actually one of the more reconstructable types. This was in 2013. And uh, these articles here from uh, respected centers, oftentimes uh, in spite of the fact that some of these cases are reconstructable, prefer amputation in the environment where resources are available for prostheses. In our quest to salvage uh, these limbs and at least uh, many of our patients just want to be able to perform activities of daily living. They're not interested in high performance sports and the benefit of not being dependent on a prosthesis for a lifetime can be significant. And so we did reconstruct this case. The result wasn't great due to some lack of follow-up, but she came back to us 10 years later and this was how she was walking. She's actually walking without crutches, which is amazing, but uh, the x-ray didn't look uh, very pretty at all. And uh, in this case, I decided to do a modification of the Huntington procedure uh, that Norgrove mentioned where we transfer the fibula to the tibia and then fixated that with an external fixator. 
unfortunately, uh, well, she had a friend to give her encouragement post-op that I was undergoing a similar procedure. And unfortunately, she developed a wound complication that left her with some exposed bone of the tibia and fibula united. Uh, we had a plastic surgeon from the United States come and visit and was able to do a rotational flap, but that failed as well. And her final operation was a cross leg flap, which we've developed a little bit of experience with and had some success at covering some of these difficult soft tissue defects in the lower extremity. This is actually a quite simple procedure and it's amazingly reliable. And this girl is a nine-year-old female. And in spite of the fact that she has an intact extensor mechanism, uh, some of these cases, just even in our environment, are not possible to really give a good result for salvage. And I think the message here, uh, amputation is oftentimes said to not be culturally acceptable in our environment and in many other parts of the world where I've worked. But I think we as providers need to take the decision in our own hands. Uh, obviously, uh, being empathetic to the parents' concerns and, cultural sensi and culturally sensitive, but uh, also be able to really try to convince the parents in what would be the best for the child and help them through that process. And this girl did end up having an amputation at our center and was fitted with a prosthesis. And the last case is a 16-year-old female with a significant bone deficit from osteomyelitis. Uh, we tried a masculet procedure, bone grafted it, had difficulty with the regenerate, and then it did a cable transport over a nail. And we also had some difficulties with that and the cables broke and tried a third revision here with a modified version of the Huntington procedure, transferring the fibula over to the tibia. And she's still in the recovery process from that, but so far doing well and starting to ambulate. In looking at amputation versus reconstruction in resource plentiful environments, psychosocial factors and function were actually shown to be equivalent in this study that was uh, groups of patients from Dr. Paley and Dr. Birch. And it really comes down to a decision between a lifetime of prosthesis and extensive surgical procedures. And it's not really possible to evaluate cost of reconstructive procedures in the same way in the developing world as it is in places like the United States. At our hospital, these procedures can be done for, they can be done extremely economically and we reuse external fixators. And many times, um, the cost uh, is actually quite achievable, even though we're in a limited resource environment. Doing quality surgery in these environments uh, involves a lot of additional efforts at our hospital, <laughs> including making sure the electricity is working, make sure our equipment's working, maintaining our inventory. And uh, in summary, uh, the message of this uh, decision-making process is that in resource environment, uh, poor environments, I think it's important to try to save everything possible, even if the functional result might not allow somebody to run in the next Port-au-Prince marathon. And uh, for trauma cases, if the mess predicts an amputation, then probably it's truly needed for amputation, but not all of the cases that predict salvage can be salvaged, the mess tends to be more specific than sensitive, in other words. And every patient must be considered on an individual basis. We can't make decisions on individuals based on whether or not they're in mass casualty or in a limited resource environment. I try to do the best for every single one of them and not just leave this decision up to the parents. Thank you very much, Nick.